Cheers. So, I want to say hello to everybody, and I'm hoping you'll say hello back and, and, you know, write hello there in the comments and say hi if you're tuning in. So, this is our first week, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, switching off the church's page and onto my own. And so, if you're new or you haven't done this before, uh, we're going chapter by chapter, going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And we did the Gospel of John. We're in the book of Acts. We move a little bit each day. And I'd encourage you to, um, I think it's up there. There's like three dots. If you click the three dots, you then can go and actually turn on the live subscriptions. So that way when we do these morning live streams, boom, you'll get a little notification. That way you can always tune in and join us. Good morning, Mila. Good morning, Dad and everyone else. So we'll see if we finish up the chapter today. Um, I'm kind of hoping we do, but uh, it's a lot to cover in the amount of time we've got together. Um, so <clears throat> let's take a look here. Um, in Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it says, Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt at Lydda, or in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So here we see Peter doing one of those miracles that we see Christ do. Uh, it reminds us of John chapter 5, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And so he heals this guy, Aeneas, and the guy had been bedridden for eight years. And this is going to be uh, playing into what we're going to learn today. I think there's some really good stuff that we as believers and as Christians need to remember and realize at times. And that has to revolve around a girl named Tabitha, a.k.a. Dorcas. Now, in case any of you are still having kids and you got a daughter coming along, Mila, maybe if you have a baby girl someday, Dorcas, just throwing it out as a possible name. Uh, so in verse 36, it says, At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Then Peter arose and went with them. When they had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the windows stood by him, widows, I said windows, the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. So here's this woman, and she has an impact on the entire town. I think this is a cool example for us of the types of ministries that God might have for us. This woman obviously had an impact in the lives of all these people. What did she do? Was she a prophetess? Was she a miracle healer? No, she was a seamstress. <laughs> she sewed things. And it just shows that sometimes God gives us very practical hobbies, interests, and giftings, because not everyone can just, you know, sew stuff up real fast. But she ministered to people. And back then, you have to understand, clothing wasn't so cheap and easy to get a hold of as today. But there was a need within the body of Christ, and this woman had a gift, and she was able to minister to people by helping with that need. And so very often we forget that sometimes we just need those physical needs met. That sometimes I might not be gifted in highly spiritual things, but God has maybe gifted me in very practical ways. And I can use those practical gifts to bless the body of Christ. And what you end up doing, why this is so important, is because the body of Christ is then edified. Your church and the church is edified the morale is increased. The bondhood of brotherhood and sisterhood is increased. And what you think is just sewing some shirts, like, oh, I just, all I do is sew. 
Right. But your sewing is building up, encouraging, and knitting together the church. And so when the pastor goes up to teach, he's not sick because he didn't catch a cold because he had a nice woolen sweater that he was wearing that whole week. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Sometimes we downplay these practical gifts that God wants to give us like it's not some special gifting, but we need these things. And so Dorcas here, she was beloved by all of the people in that area. And so when she died, everyone's weeping. It says, Peter comes and, and they're showing him, look, look, they're showing him all the stuff that she had made. And so it says that Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him the upper room. So they're showing the tunics, verse 40. But Peter put them out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, what's interesting is that in the Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Mark, etc., I think it's actually Mark 541 where it gives us the, uh, the, the original language. It says that when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, he says, little girl or little lamb, arise. In the Hebrew, Talitha Kumi. What Peter says right here is actually Tabitha Kumi. <laughs> One letter difference. Tabitha, Tabitha. Kumi, arise. So it's, it's just a fascinating little, little connection here. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when she called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. So we've done some of the little stuff right? Just little tidbits that I think are very good for us to know and understand the idea of how our, our, our ministries might be simple things like sewing. But there's another big deal here. You see, Peter came to Lydda and then he was only a stone's throw away to get to Joppa. Remember verse 38, since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples heard that Peter was there, they called for him. He's now staying in the house of Simon the Tanner. In the next chapter, it's going to be a pivotal chapter in the whole Bible. Cornelius, the Italian centurion, is going to get saved. He and his whole house. This is the first time we're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. And this is where we see the commission to the Gentiles. And we see that God wants to bring the Gentiles in. Up until this point, it's only been Jews and Samaritans, which was a big step for the Jewish people, but they were still kind of Jewish. And so we're going to see the gospel now go through the open door to the rest of the world. And when God tells Cornelius, go find Peter He's at Simon the Tanner's house. Well, the only reason he was at Simon the Tanner's house is because he healed uh, Tabitha. But the only reason he healed Tabitha was because he was nearby in Lydda. What's up with Lydda? Aeneas was there. And do you remember back in verse 33, he had been bedridden for eight years. That would take us back basically right to the beginning of when Jesus was doing his ministry in the Galilee and down in Judea and that whole area. So the question is, is why hadn't this guy Aeneas been healed by Jesus? I wonder if he tried. Could Aeneas have been a guy at the pool of Bethesda? Just like the man in John 5 when Jesus, there's a whole pool you know, beachside, you might say, around the pools of Bethesda, the five porches of people wanting to get healed. But Jesus only heals the one. And sometimes we wonder, why doesn't God miraculously heal me? He does still at times, but why does he always? Why didn't he heal me? Why is it God has let me suffer eight years? Do you wonder if Aeneas has been praying for eight years? But the key is, is that 
God had a plan to save the world. But Peter needed to be there in Joppa at the house of Simon the Tanner. And he needed to be there at the right time, which would have been when Dorcas died. If he had not waited eight years to heal Aeneas, he wouldn't have been in the right city in time to save Dorcas. And if he hadn't been in the city to save Dorcas, he wouldn't have been in the right place at the right time to go up and meet with Cornelius. The point is, is that sometimes we don't see the effect that our waiting for answers to prayer might have on others. And so as we are waiting for God to answer our prayers, we need to trust that he has a bigger and grander plan that we can be a part of. Aeneas had to eight, wait eight years before he was healed, but that put Peter in the right place at the right time to bring Dorcas back from the dead, which is gonna put him in the right place at the right time to be at Simon the Tanner's house. Why doesn't God always answer our prayers? Well, because sometimes there's a bigger thing going on that we can't see, but we can trust him that he is at work. So that's just the last thing is God's timing. Sometimes we need to wait on God's timing. So God bless you guys. Have a great day. And I will see you guys tomorrow morning, 730, right back here. Take care.